So it's uh, it's on the hour. It's uh, four o'clock in Buffalo, New York. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone from um, literally around the world for the uh, talk today. Uh, so thank you for joining us for this exciting lecture to celebrate our new cryo-electron microscopy center. Um, my name is Eddie Snell. Um, I'm the CEO and president of the Houtman Woodward Medical Research Institute. Um, and I, we welcome you, you here. Uh, thanks also to Fermo Fisher for the sponsorship of this event and the numerous corporations, foundations, and community members who've made this new center a reality. The Houtman Woodward Medical Research Institute's been a pioneer in structural biology for over 60 years, developing technologies and making groundbreaking discoveries. Our high throughput crystallization screening labs have been in operation for about 20 years, providing services to industry and academia, and to date has worked on over 19,000 different proteins, um, including many associated with the COVID-19 pandemic. We also operate the IMCA beam line for six of the world's top 10 pharmaceutical companies at the uh, Argonne um, Laboratory at the Advanced Photon Source. And now we are so pleased that cryo-electron microscopy is added to our toolbox. Um, thanks to each of you for taking time to join us today for this inaugural event. I'm pleased to see many familiar faces, including members of the National Science Foundation BioXFL Science and Technology Center that's uh, uh, co-led by uh, the University of Buffalo and HWI. And I would like to introduce Dr. Xuxing Zhang, who joined us to lead our new cryo-electron microscopy center, building on our history and taking us into the future and I will ask him to introduce the center and an honored speaker whose role can only be described as critical in one of the most profound changes in structural biology in my life and the life of a lot of us as structural biologists, Nobel laureate, Professor Joachim Frank. I believe HWI's Nobel laureate, Herb Houtman, would be so pleased and appreciative that Professor Frank was generous enough to agree to give this lecture. And thank you on behalf of our namesake, Herb, HWI and, uh, and Professor Frank for, for giving the lecture. Um, so Xu Xing, the floor or the video screen as we now say is yours. And if you would like to, uh, to introduce uh, the, the lecture, thank you. Thank you, Andy. Hi everyone, uh, my name is uh, Xu Xing Jiang. Um, I will introduce the center briefly and then uh, introduce Dr. Frank. Uh, thanks to all again for attending this uh, opening event for the new CryoEM Center at uh, HWI. Our center aims to providing academic and commercial users with, with high throughput delivery of high resolution CryoEM data and helping them address fundamental questions in basic sciences and all performing uh, structure-based drug design in order to develop new molecular therapeutics. <laughs> After a year of preparation in space and instrumentation, our first system made of glaciers and a Falcon 4 direct electron detector was installed and recently benchmarked at around 2.3 angstrom resolution with only uh, overnight data collection. This first system is thus satis suitable for fulfilling our aims and we are ready to um, open the services to uh, different users. We plan to add more microscopes in the future. At this exciting moment, it's a great honor for us to have uh, Dr. Frank's lecture to signify a new phase at HWI. Dr. Frank is a towering figure in structural biology and one of the pioneers for single particle cryoEM. He formulated the mathematical framework for single particle analysis and built a set of computational tools for such analysis. At the same time, he applied these tools to review new structural insights on the ribosomes, the nanomachines that make proteins in all cells. As a personal note, when I was a graduate student, I learned the single particle analysis from Dr. Frank in a workshop he organized with Dr. Wachu's group in Pittsburgh. Over there, I was inspired by the idea of computational crystallography and the general thinking of no theoretic limit for cryoEM to reach new atomic resolutions. After nearly 30, 20 years, cryoEM can now reach that goal fairly routinely. 
It's also interesting to note that both Dr. Frank and Dr. Hauptmann, the namesake of HWI, started from mathematical frameworks and developed new methods for structural biology, and both <clears throat> won a Nobel Prize in chemistry. Mathematics obviously went a long way for both of them. Finally, I would like to mention that for his seminal contributions, Dr. Frank was recognized with well, various rewards and memberships in different professional groups. To name a few, he was elected to the National Academy of Sciences and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and was recognized uh, by a Franklin Medal for Life Sciences in 2014 and ultimately the highest honor in science, the 2017 Nobel Prize in Chemistry shared with Professors Jack Dubachet and Richard Henderson. Today, he will present a fascinating topic on using cryo-EM to study biological complexes in their native states, revealing the dynamics of these nanomachines. Without further ado, I'm now transferring the virtual podium to Dr. Frank. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me uh, there. Uh, it's, it's a great honor to be here and uh, I didn't expect uh, such a large audience and uh, essentially I've given, I've given lectures before on cryo-EM and I just wanted to highlight a particular number of areas um, and uh, make this more, more like a chat. Uh, so, uh, first of all, um, oh, okay. <clears throat> first of all, congratulations for the inauguration of your center. Uh, that's a fabulous achievement, and it certainly brings uh, the <clears throat> Hauptmann Woodward Center uh, into a new direction. And uh, I could only say, welcome to the club. You know. Uh, <clears throat> so. Um, a, to give a, a, a brief outline of what I want to say, uh, I want to uh, so briefly talk about the <clears throat> program of structural biology uh, and uh, reductionism. The timeline of single particle cryo-EM, I'm going to come back to this a number of times um, throughout my talk. And then I wanted to highlight uh, the relationship between extra crystallography and cryo-EM. Uh, especially inspired by the fact that um, uh, <clears throat> Herbert Hauptmann uh, has been one of the founders of, the, of your institute. Uh, and then I had to have a, a little detour into medieval iconography of scientists. Uh, and then also uh, after presenting a few structures, I just uh, wanted to highlight the importance of cryo -EM in uh, fighting the pandemics that we're <clears throat> going through right now. So <clears throat> we know that the cell is packed with molecules. Here's, here's one of these wonderful drawings by David Goodsell. Uh, life processes are interactions between molecules. And uh, we all know that to understand life uh, in healthy or sick organism, we need to know the structures of molecules and the way they interact. And uh, molecular medicine and, personal, and personalized medicine relies on this information. But here is a structure of a generalized cell. Uh, you can see that there are many compartments <coughs> and uh, many membranes, uh, many different kinds of organization. Everything is packed very firmly, and it is very, it is a daunting task to actually study molecules in this kind of crowded environment at the resolution that is required to uh, discover their interactions. And that is why um, we are <clears throat> using uh, reductionism. We study a subsystem in isolation in vitro, hoping to at least approximate the processes in the environment of the cell. Uh, now, <clears throat> uh, Bruce Alberts has 
very strongly introduced the concept of molecular machines. They were around before, but, but his uh, article in 1998 uh, helped popularize the concept. And uh, <clears throat> I remember uh, in the beginning paragraph says, we have always underestimated the cell because for a long time, the cell was thought to be some kind of a sack of, of molecules that are all randomly swimming around and running into each other and perform reactions. But the cell is, is really highly uh, compartmentalized and uh, the molecules actually interact with one another in, in, uh, in combinations uh, called molecular machines. They act in concert and very often in a processive way, which means that there's a beginning and an, uh, and an uh, intermediate states and, uh, and, an, and an end state. And very often these processes are, are circular. And we want to understand these in all details. We want to not, not only know the structure, but also the way the molecules interact with one another. <clears throat> so, uh, <clears throat> Uh, with that, I just immediately jump into 3D reconstruction of asymmetric molecules by single particle techniques, uh, and the concept. Yeah, so single particle techniques, the structural information comes from images of single, which means unattached molecules that exist in many copies. And the molecules are free to assume all naturally occurring conformations. The molecules are randomly oriented. And so a single snapshot may already give us hundreds of particle views. <clears throat> and uh, hundreds is not enough. <clears throat> and uh, in order to fill the entire angular range, we typically need many such uh, snapshots. And so gradually we fill the entire angular space. And the advantage of these techniques is <clears throat> that uh, we don't we don't actually have to tilt um, the molecules are already tilted by the, all by themselves and <clears throat> so essentially it is a concept uh, for solving a number of problems all at the same time <clears throat> one is <clears throat> that we don't have to uh, we don't need to crystallize the uh, the, uh, the molecules uh, we simply use them as they are in, in solution. And the second is, is that we can spread the radiation uh, dose uh, over a very large number of molecules. So that reduces the radiation damage. And then the, of, the obvious advantage is that we can access the entire angular range all at once. <clears throat> So instead of telling you uh, all the uh, gory technical details and all the math, <clears throat> and only wanted to, and wanted wanted to show you a, a couple of uh, uh, just a few pictures of the time, and one uh, that I find more and more unbelievable is the kinds of computation that was available at the time. So <clears throat> this was here my my workhorse IBM eleven thirty. Uh, which was situated in um, <clears throat> Walter Hoppe's um, <clears throat> laboratory. And we were, they were very uh, proud when, when they were able to, <clears throat> to buy it. Uh, it's a memory of 4K, uh, and these are 16-bit words. It was introduced in 1965, uh, and we got a machine in 1960, um, <clears throat> 1967 or 1968. <clears throat> so here, uh, <clears throat> this is essentially the culture uh, that we had. You can recognize the 60s. Uh, there's also my good friend, Martin Kessel, who I believe is in the audience, and William Goldfarb. So this was sort of the beginning of, of everything. <clears throat> and the very first um, a demonstration of the workings of this kind of uh, idea in, in two dimension was with glutamine synthetase. And this was published in 1978. You can see uh, that um, uh, little windows are excised from the micrograph 
and uh, only the ones that uh, faces in a certain orientation were used. And then that leads to a particle gallery. And then uh, <clears throat> after uh, cross correlation uh, and rotational correlation, we can find the al alignment, we can get, get an average, and here is a symmetrized average. So that was all that paper achieved. <clears throat> and <clears throat> then uh, came all the other uh, algorithms that were required in order to make everything to work and uh, get a three-dimensional structure. And uh, one, uh, one of the heroes here is Michael Rademacher, who uh, specifically uh, worked on the programs on <clears throat> of <clears throat> three-dimensional reconstruction. Uh, this was the idea of the random conical tilt reconstruction, which was a bootstrapping technique. And that led us to, for, to, the, for the, to the first uh, ever single particle reconstruction was published in 1987. Um, <clears throat> it was a reconstruction of the 50S Rabelsobel subunit. Um, and it is here displayed as a contour stack, uh, which was one of the first ways of representing a three-dimensional structure. So here you ha we have um, contours that are drawn on transparencies in, in slices of the structure, <clears throat> and they are then mounted uh, with the, with the, with the um, <clears throat> corresponding distance uh, in, a, in a light box. And it could be viewed in a light box. <clears throat> and then from there, now just imagine uh, from there, from <clears throat> 1978, um, or from 1986, now we are in uh, 2020, and uh, <clears throat> we have this beautiful paper by uh, the MRC group, uh, single party cryo M at atomic resolution. And it goes all the way to 1.2 angstrom resolution for, for the uh, <clears throat> apoferritin, uh, which is by now not an interesting specimen anymore because it's been, uh, it's been reconstructed hundreds of times uh, just to show the uh, efficacy of a particular algorithm or instrumentation. But um, so uh, still the uh, highest resolution uh, probably of a biological object here is uh, of the GABA A receptor uh, in the range of 1.6 uh, angstroms. So it, it, it is this incredible jump uh, in resolution is, is, is really uh, completely staggering. <clears throat> and uh, so I wanted to show you the timeline. Uh, <clears throat> recently, I have to do something with this. Okay. <clears throat> the timeline, <clears throat> I was, in 2017, I was asked by Nature Protocols to put together um, essentially sort of an, um, an illustration of the progress uh, in a single particle cryo-EM. And this is the first part uh, of this. Uh, it, it starts here with the reconstruction and so forth. Now, these are not simply contributions by my group. Uh, they increasingly involve other groups. Uh, and I essentially list the milestones here. And I just go, I wanna, wanna go through this. Um, <clears throat> in 70, in 1970 was the reconstruction of an icosahedral virus. Now, the single particle techniques that I'm talking about really have no, uh, have no uh, assumption of symmetry. And that makes them special because uh, be be before that, uh, you had essentially, you had to have different programs for different symmetries. Uh, and <clears throat> uh, and uh, the, the technique that I introduced uh, did, did completely away with this. But nevertheless, this was a milestone uh, achieved by uh, Tony Crowther at, at the MRC. And then uh, <clears throat> uh, the concept of the generalized single particle approach was published in 1975. And the demo that I just showed you was in 1978. Um, 
And then a number of problems had to be solved that had to do with uh, sorting, sorting out uh, particles that had the same view with the same uh, <clears throat> orientation and so forth. So was, this was all done with multivariate statistical analysis. <clears throat> and in order to achieve all this, I designed a, mo a modular software system for single particle construction, which, which was called SPIDER, that greatly uh, facilitated all these different developments. <clears throat> And then, um, so we had a, a re reconstruction by, uh, <clears throat> by <clears throat> a, a random conical tilt. And then uh, there were up initial methods. Well, random conical tilt was one of the up initial methods and another one was angular reconstitution, the so-called a common lines. So these came uh, around 1987, and from then on, we really had a, a general way of getting uh, <clears throat> getting reconstructed uh, reconstruction started. Then we had 3D projection matching and angular refinement uh, in order to fill uh, gaps that were miss uh, that were miss missing here. <clears throat> and then uh, the my favorite molecule was always the ribosome because that was sort of the molecule with which I could demonstrate all the different uh, <clears throat> different steps in the progress um, of the uh, implementation of the algorithm. And <clears throat> so here we had uh, in 1995, it was a, a, a very, very good reconstruction that showed a lot of molecular details of the ribosome at 25 angstrom resolution. <clears throat> and uh, meanwhile, viral structure progressed in resolution much faster uh, because they had the additional aid of symmetry. So this, these were using different kind of program systems. And here we already hit the seven angstrom mark in 1997. <clears throat> and uh, this was now really the time when uh, the, 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 the whole improvements in, in cryo-EM uh, and, the, and the intense biological interest uh, produced, produced a pressure on the, on the industry uh, in order to uh, create uh, more and more specialized machines uh, that were more and more uh, <clears throat> a, a apt to a, <clears throat> to use the, the technology, um, and <clears throat> so so these these were was really a phase that really resulted in uh, the first sort of high end machine, which was the Polara, which came out uh, around two thousand, and we got one of the first machines in uh, when I was in Albany at the time. <clears throat> so uh, introduction of field emission gun was was one. Uh, <clears throat> introduction, and then, uh, <clears throat> uh, and then all kinds of other things happened. Uh, we had uh, <clears throat> in, in 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 terms of the ribosome, you know, we had high hopes that we would get uh, to very high resolution, uh, but then we were beaten by uh, X-ray crystallography in two thousand. It was the uh, was the big year where three uh, <clears throat> three um, uh, ribosome structures were published, and but uh, I have to mention that already at the time the uh, large structure of the large subunit uh, in in the Yale lab uh, benefited from uh, <clears throat> phasing contributions by cryo electron microscopy by a, a, a cryo EM map that uh, we made them uh, available. <clears throat> and here, this is, a, I, I'd like to highlight this here because of what we uh, are gonna uh, come, come, come to later on. Uh, this was the first workshop in the biannual bio series on hybrid methods in cryo EM. And the, uh, the hybrid methods really uh, <clears throat> came about because there was a realization that uh, <clears throat> we would all benefit from get, uh, getting 
ideas that were in the X-ray uh, community and the EM communi community, as well as computational biology. So this really formed an, a whole network of, of participants that uh, got to know each other uh, much more closely. <clears throat> Flexible fitting, well, this was really an idea that was really pushed by the fact that we, we did have X-ray uh, structures <clears throat> at high resolution. And on the other hand, we had observations of, of maps uh, by cryo-EM. They were low resolution, but they clearly showed uh, different conformational states. So the idea was to fit uh, the X-ray structure into the, um, into the EM map uh, in the most plausible way. So there were a number of fitting methods that were developed at the time. <clears throat> uh, and then it went on uh, with maximum likelihood uh, uh, approaches for classific 3D classification. Uh, we realized and uh, other people also realized that it was possible to extract uh, uh, different structures from the same sample. Uh, so it was possible to do this all at the same time uh, with these very powerful programs. And from then on, we really have a, a, a technology that is able to, to grab uh, <clears throat> uh, an entire series of structures all at the same time from the same sample. And this is a, really a, a beautiful uh, improvement in, in structural biology techniques. And I already told you about flexible fitting. There is an, the one powerful method of flexible fitting uh, I was uh, involved in uh, together with uh, Klaus Schulten, MDFF, flexible fitting via molecular dynamics uh, simulations. <clears throat> and uh, a timer soft uh, cry -EM, uh, came about in 2009. Well, uh, this is uh, we, we all know about uh, Unwin and uh, Berryman and Unwin's uh, first introduction of time resolved cryo EM, uh, but uh, the one that uh, was introduced in 2009 worked on a different principle where two components are mixed directly on a, in a microfluidic chip. So they are not mixed on the grid, uh, but in the chip uh, in a, a separate fashion. <clears throat> Here is another milestone, 2009, reconstruction of icosahedral virus at near three angstrom resolution. Uh, so we are close to the atomic range uh, with this reconstruction. Uh, but uh, the, <clears throat> and then we have a maximum likelihood um, approach to classification. The, uh, it's, it's, it's the same approach but these, uh, uh, these programs were, uh, 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 were an improvement on the ones that had been introduced before. So these were really uh, the, uh, the, the ones that are most closely related to the ones that are now in the Reliance software. Now, uh, 2012 is a, is a milestone uh, and because this was the <clears throat> time when the first commercially available direct electron detection cameras were introduced by three different companies. And from then on, everything, the, everything changed. Uh, we talk about the resolution revolution uh, and the first spectacular uh, result by Yifan Chen in 2013, the first membrane channel solved by cryo-EM at near three angstrom resolution. And then from then on, uh, I, the whole timeline sort of breaks off here because this was the really the time that I had reviewed. And uh, you know pretty much the rest. Uh, there are thousands of structures. We, the barrier, the two angstrom barrier is broken and so forth. <clears throat> so <clears throat> a, my, my actual contributions, my, my um, contribution to the math and computation was, was very much concentrated in these first years. And this is also um, pointed out in the Nobel uh, citation. Uh, so it's all condensed in the, in the, in the years between 
1975 and 1986. And I, I, I just show iconically these, these different uh, contributions here. This is the you know, alignment rate, uh, algorithms uh, using cross-correlation, uh, multivariate statistical analysis in order to sort pictures, uh, the introduction of this modular image processing system, and the uh, random conical uh, reconstruction method uh, that I told you about before. So this is, was all pretty much circumcised here. And then uh, around here in 1987 or 85, um, the, uh, <coughs> uh, the cryo methods uh, became adopted everywhere. They had already been introduced in 1981 by, um, by Jacques Dubochet. Uh, but uh, first only applied to viruses and only later it came in, um, <clears throat> in general circulation. <clears throat> okay, now I just uh, want to, want to uh, make a, a diversion. Uh, I very much um, appreciated uh, getting to know Herbert Hauptmann uh, at my visit. Now, when I received this year, uh, invitation, the invitation by Jill, um, I thought, oh, well, you know, I was there maybe um, uh, a little bit, maybe after 2000 or so. And then I looked through my lectures and uh, uh, my lecture um, list and found out I was actually there in 1991, so much, much earlier. And I was there on a special site visit uh, by NIH uh, to review a a uh, proposal that was brought in by Hauptmann and other uh, PIs. Uh, so this was, this was really the first time that I was there and it, it was already the new building. It was a fantastic building. And I very much appreciated this visit and I remembered it now. Um, and <clears throat> Hauptmann and Carla got um, their Nobel Prize just six years before for their outstanding achievements in developing direct methods for the determination of crystal structures. And <clears throat> so, uh, <clears throat> so I'm just in, in my mind, uh, Herbert Hauptmann is a sort of my real space companion uh, in a way. <clears throat> and uh, now that brings me to uh, the Nobel Prize in uh, relationship to X-ray crystallography. It, it is remarkable that 5% of all Nobel Prizes uh, a, are actually related to X-ray crystallography. And half of these were for biomolecules. And in this, uh, <clears throat> in this uh, compilation that was made by Vladivar uh, and others, and published in FAB's journal in 2014, uh, they distinguish between the, uh, the UK uh, branch or, or the European branch and the American branch. Uh, and they have arranged all you know, people uh, and, and the way they are related to each other. So only the, the ones that are uh, in, in bold are the Nobel uh, <clears throat> uh, laureates uh, but they're connected here uh, through various pathways to their mentors. Um, and uh, I was astonished when I now look back at this, I had already I had this slide around for, for a while to make several points, but then I was astonished that I, I, find, I found neither Hauptmann nor Carla there. So I put them there uh, and these were the so-called treeless people the, the people who, who had no visible connection to mentors in the same field uh, is Ada Jonas, Brian Koblicka, uh, Lefkowitz, and McKinnon. Uh, so I put them there, but uh, you know I could be persuaded to put them somewhere else if somebody has uh, more information about this. <clears throat> and uh, it, it, it makes sense in a way because they are mathematicians and uh, they are really um, not rooted in, in, in a particular um, application field, but rather they are rooted in, uh, in, a, 
a, in a very general area and they simply develop an interest in aiding a particular field. <clears throat> so, uh, and I wanted to point out that X-ray crystallography and EM uh, were very much already in, uh, in relationship uh, right at the beginning. Uh, and <clears throat> there's a confluence between the two techniques. And, uh, and it's not surprising that um, the, <clears throat> the early roots of, of electron microscopy as a technique for studying molecules are found in the midst of adventurous X-ray crystallographers. So uh, <clears throat> Aaron Kluke, uh, I want to mention David de Rossier, they were the first ones to introduce uh, 3D reconstruction as a computational technique for uh, 3D reconstruction. And then uh, my mentor, Walter Hopper, was originally an X-ray crystallographer. He, he uh, made some uh, important um, theoretical contributions to the field. And then he turned his attention to electron microscopy in the early uh, 60s. And that's exactly sort of the, the environment that, that I was thrown in. Now, the uh, important for the rapid dissemination of ideas and techniques in the earlier days, um, Hopper, along with Max Perutz, co-organized several meetings. And Max Perutz, uh, and <clears throat> the pioneer of uh, protein crystallography. And the, <clears throat> so uh, the, the first meeting, meeting was in Hirschach uh, in the Austrian Alps in 1968. And uh, for me as a newcomer in 1967, it was the first time I was thrown into this really big, um, a, a group of, of people with an incredible amount of sophistication. So this it br brought together extra crystallographers with the earlier pioneers of electron crystallography. I say electron crystallography because ele all application of electron microscopy uh, to molecules was really crystallography because nobody pursued single particle ideas except for myself. <clears throat> so uh, uh here we are in the winter uh, and uh, they were pretty much organized like um, Gordon conferences with a lot of time set aside in the afternoon for skiing. And uh, among the people that I wanna mention that were there at the first meeting was Harold Erickson, uh, Richard Henderson, Ken Holmes, Hugh Huxley, Nigel Unwin and many others. <clears throat> so uh, there have been some, some people who made pronouncements about uh, the relationship between X-ray and cryo-EM. Uh, Shoemaker and Ando, uh, in this article, they say cryo-EM will not replace crystallography, but the competition between these two techniques will drive innovation and specialization of these techniques to areas in which they excel. And the fruit of this competition will push the frontiers of structural biology forward, possibly for decades to come, perhaps finally allowing us to cast a lens on molecular, uh, <clears throat> macromolecular assemblies in vivo, understand the motions of proteins and gain a high precision view into catalysis. <clears throat> well, I was last, uh, in 2019, in Osaka, I was invited to a diffraction meeting. And as a keynote speaker at a diffraction meeting, uh, um, it, it was, yeah, I felt like I was a wolf in a, in a sheep's uh, clothes. Um, because uh, to me, crystals are not good examples of lifelike environments for molecules. They act as energy traps and uh, they make me actually think of ice nine. Uh, ice-9. Uh, ice-9 is a fictitious alternative structure of water that is solid at room temperature. When a crystal of ice-9 contacts liquid water, it acts as a seed crystal that makes the molecules of liquid water arrange themselves into the solid form of lowest energy, namely ice-9, and life ceases under these conditions. So this was all in uh, Kurt Vonnegut's very funny book, uh, Cat's Grill. <clears throat> And this is because life requires a multiplicity of states. 
that are accessible at normal temperatures. So if we if we look for a structure at the at the absolute minimum of energy, we we uh, most likely find a structure that will not uh, sustain life. It, it will not uh, come uh, out of this trap, <clears throat> or, and it will will not typify a molecule uh, in the living environment. So what we what we really want are the states of, of a molecule in these uh, meso, mesoscopic uh, states <clears throat> in medium energy uh, where they only visit local energy minima and uh, they are separated by hurdles that can be circumvented in the thermal environment. <clears throat> so I just wanted to uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, start with an, with an image of um, Herbert Hauptmann in 1995 that I found. And uh, it, really, it really fits into a series of a collection that I started sometime earlier of a, a scientist essentially looking at his lifetime achievements or it looks, looks at, at some kind of an, an, an item uh, that is iconic. Uh, and typically, this is in, in, in the office, in the, in the office or in some kind of a, a cloister uh, environment. <clears throat> and uh, what's, what's important there is, is that um, he is captured in a, in, an, in a contemplation, in a contemplative mode. And, and this is important in, in, the, in the whole depiction of this because uh, this is something, this kind of post has been captured by painters uh, in, in early ages. So here we have, um, in, <clears throat> we have one of those, and I don't know who exactly this was. Uh, here we have another one uh, in, in this very intense con contemplation. Uh, there is a, is a famous uh, picture by jo Johannes Vermeer in 1668, the astronomer. Here's Don Caspar, and he, 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 he is depicted by, um, by draftsmen uh, in a very funny way. He, he is put into a medieval environment by, um, uh, by, the, <coughs> uh, by the artist. And and uh, he he looks he looks at at the, uh, <clears throat> such an uh, intersecting uh, series, uh, almost a Russian Russian doll kind of series, uh, and and uh, and the subject is quasi equivalence, and you could also you could even see this in conjunction with um, an astronomer looking at spheres <clears throat> in the sky. And then this brings me to the Wattsworth Center in 1998. Uh, only afterwards I saw this really fit into this entire series. They, <clears throat> the photographer had placed me there in front of the ribosome. Now the ribosome had just gotten uh, this really great resolution at nine, uh, of, of 25 angstrom. And this whole this depiction reminded me of what, um, what we just saw before. And here the Berkshire Eagle, the local paper in Great Barrington, um, it has, it, it took a picture in, uh, in a similar vein. You know, of, of course, this all, this all reminds, uh, reminds us of one uh, very iconic image, which is this one in Helsingborg and relating to the famous Shakespeare play. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, I just wanted to continue here, and I <clears throat> I already uh, showed you this here and the importance of this line here because after we gotten these cameras, then all of a sudden the whole world was open, and <clears throat> for for us uh, with with this intense concentration of the ribosome, we were able to get uh, a structure at two and a half angstrom, which was unbelievable. Uh, <clears throat> it showed here the base pairing in detail. Uh, we saw 
individual um, ions, magnesium ions, zinc ion. We saw uh, positions of water molecule, alpha helical structure, and so forth. So this was really mind boggling. And I'm just showing you this, um, <clears throat> a, this whole structure uh, because it's really magnificent to behold. Uh, <clears throat> and you can also see one features of, of uh, single particle uh, reconstruction, uh, which is that you have um, a resolu the resolution is, is a local quantity. Uh, and typically the interior of the molecule has the highest resolution and then it peters out toward the, um, <clears throat> toward the um, periphery. <clears throat> okay, and then uh, around that time, uh, uh, essentially, you know, uh, as you know, many, many people are now looking at molecules. W the, the way it affected me at Columbia was that um, all of a sudden, a lot of people uh, knocked on my door and they wanted to do uh, the same fancy thing as uh, Yifan Cheng. Uh, here we have the umpire receptor. Uh, I got involved in, in, a, in a variety of um, ion channel structures. And uh, one of the most beautiful ones uh, was the ryanodine receptor or calcium release channel. And it was a uh, result of a collaboration with um, <clears throat> Wayne Hendrickson and, uh, <clears throat> and um, um, Andy Marks. Uh, these are two labs that had already collaborated on an X-ray structure, but had not gotten anywhere uh, beyond seven angstroms for nine years. And then cry um, uh, solved this. Uh, cystic fibrosis, uh, this here is a structure that was uh, done at the Rockefeller uh, <clears throat> Rockefeller Institute, uh, but uh, we are working uh, with John Hunt uh, on a on the structure uh, of the mutant that is important for the uh, <clears throat> cystic fibrosis illness. <clears throat> and uh, a, the a, when uh, when this uh, structure of beta galactosidase came out two point two resolution, uh, this was the first time all these beautiful uh, molecular signatures uh, of amino acids came out and uh, with it, the capability of simply sequencing a structure by going uh, uh, around in the, uh, <clears throat> uh, in the density map itself. Uh, so you didn't even have to know uh, the, the structure uh, you didn't have to know the sequence from other information. And then, um, well, uh, I want to make the point that uh, we had this just in time and, um, situation. 2012 uh, was when the sudden jump occurred. And now look at the series of, of um, pandemics that uh, have, have, um, <clears throat> have plagued us. Uh, including the one that we are going through right now. There's MERS, Zika, Ebola, Dengue, and SARS-CoV-2. Uh, all these happened afterwards. And in all of these, cryem, single party cryem has made crucial contributions to the understanding of the structure, to the fight um, of the disease. The case of the SARS, uh, COV-2, uh, we have contributions both to vaccine development and the development of, uh, uh, of effective antibodies. Uh, here, by the way, I sort of try to continue the timeline uh, into 2021. And uh, I used the galactosidos as an iconic picture and this here is the apoferritin because many, many things are now apoferritin. You know, it, it just goes on with apoferritin. <clears throat> um, so uh, you've all seen these spectacular pictures. Uh, and uh, the, you know, I like the anecdote that just two weeks after receiving the uh, genetic sequence from Chinese researchers, the team, 
uh, uh, had designed and produced samples of their stabilized uh, spike protein. And it took 12 more days to reconstruct the 3D atomic scales map. Uh, and, uh, and this came out uh, in science in, in March. <clears throat> and uh, so here are the relevant structures and the very big contribution uh, where cryo-EM uh, was, was absolutely crucial was um, the um, uh, discovery uh, of the stabilization uh, and, the, and the structural manifestation of the stabilization uh, that could be done by, by a single point rotation. And that uh, has been crucial in the uh, development of the, of the vaccine. <clears throat> and uh, I just want to highlight a, a, um, a study that was done uh, at Columbia by uh, <clears throat> these people are Columbia Michael Rupp, uh, he's, a, he's a student and uh, Larry Shapiro. And <clears throat> uh, they, they were uh, the ones uh, doing the uh, CryEM uh, contributions. Um, and uh, they uh, mapped the, um, uh, the sites of the, the epitopes of the potent uh, neutralizing antibodies against um, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and uh, the, the antibodies were identified uh, from patients uh, at, uh, at Columbia, at the Columbia Hospital. Um, and uh, it, it turned out that um, a, uh, uh, using using uh, using the categories of, of certain symptoms, uh, they were able to get the most effective antibodies uh, from uh, through this source. And here is an, an, uh, uh, one of the images uh, showing the antibody mapping uh, by uh, by using the cry um, uh, visualization. <clears throat> So uh, you may all have seen uh, the explosion of data that are generated uh, on a yearly basis now. This is a plot of the rates and not, the, not of the number of structures, but the rates of, of depositions per year. You can see that the rate uh, has leveled out uh, for X-ray crystallography. It is slightly fallen. Uh, from by NMR uh, from from the year 2005 or so, but you can see that uh, in cryoEM it's in steep rise uh, in a in linear way. So we can probably very soon um, uh, find that uh, the number of structures uh, through cryoEM you know might might outrun the structures that have been. Uh, deposited uh, from um, from the X-ray source. So, in conclusion, single particle cryo um, is uh, uh, a new era in structural biology. There is no need for crystals. Very small sample quantities are needed. Resolution in the three to four Arsum range it can now routinely uh, be achieved. Well, you know, essentially, I was I was really. At the, at the end of my lecture, uh, I just had a, a few more things to go on that particular slide. And the only thing that was missing uh, was a picture of my group uh, on top of the laboratory, uh, laboratory building. So for all practical purposes, I can simply um, stop the lecture right here. And thank you very much for your attention.